It turns out that that thing that Jesse said about John Oswald, that he blogs about uh, swaddling his children, is true. Um, because uh, I actually, I've been meaning to thank you for this for two years. You taught me how to swaddle my son. Uh, so, so thank you, John Allspa. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so I'm John Rouser, uh, and I'm here to talk to you today uh, about looking more deeply at your data. Uh, but I want to begin uh, by, by uh, or, or actually this talk ends with, uh, with this and with this uh, and with that and uh, maybe a little bit of that. Uh, but it begins uh, with you. Uh, so imagine yourself for a moment uh, back at your office, maybe you're monitoring your site or you're trying to assess the impact of some latency improvement and you've got just this totally badass dashboard. Uh, or maybe you're a little more old school um, or maybe your site actually, or pardon me, your operations center actually looks like this and you're spending your time looking at this venerable beast, uh, the time series chart. Uh, along the x-axis is time, and along the y-axis is something like the average page latency, or the number of hits, or the amount of network traffic, or the percentage of errors, or some statistic like that. And there's one point for every time period. Uh, but what does this chart really mean? Like, how did those 24 points get generated? Take this point here. It looks like uh, 295 milliseconds during the 10 a.m. hour. What we did to get that point is to take all the hits between 10 a.m. and 11 a.m., thousands or maybe millions of them, and boil them down into a single number, a summary statistic, in this case, the average. And the question I put to you today is what do you lose in that process? To make it just a bit more concrete, this is Vincent van Gogh's magnum opus, Starry Night. Uh, I could have a, an art historian come up and speak to you for an hour about the influence of this piece and how it was at the vanguard of what we now call modern art. Or I could have a Van Gogh biographer come uh, and talk to you for an hour about the events that led Van Gogh to check himself into the mental institution where this was his view. Um, or I could have an art instructor come up and talk to you about in, in excruciating detail the brushing techniques that Van Gogh ch used to achieve the overall effect of the painting. Or I could tell you that hexadecimal 4C, 5C, 6D is the average hue of Starry Night. <laughs> and just be done with it, right? Like, piece of cake. Uh, to take another example, Moby Dick, uh, uh, a fine example of the great American novel. D.H. Lawrence said of Moby Dick that it moves awe in the soul. Uh, well, that's nice, uh, but I'm here to tell you that if you take all the words in Moby Dick, you lowercase them and put them in alphabetical order, the minimum word is A. The maximum word is Zoroaster. Uh, the 99th percentile word is ye. <laughs> and via a dubious algorithm of my own devising, uh, the average word in Moby Dick is <laughs> <laughs> uh, Which brings up an unfortunate fact about the average, which is that usually the average of a sample is not equal to any particular value in the sample. Uh, in particular, does not exist anywhere in Moby Dick. And the point of all this is that summary statistics, statistics like the average, the median, the 90th percentile, summary statistics are useful but very lossy compression algorithms. Um, Thousands of intricate stories went into the making of this one number, 295 milliseconds. But no one would argue that that one number teaches you much about the, the complexity of those stories. In the same way that no one travels to the Museum of Modern Art in New York to see this, they go to see Starry Night. Uh, and while it is amusing that ye is the 99th percentile word in Moby Dick, no one would argue that knowing that teaches you much about one of the greatest works of American literature. And so it is with this the ubiquitous time series chart of summary statistics. It is a useful tool, but one of limited depth. It gives you little insight into what is going on with your customers. So if this is a shallow view, what's better? How can we look more deeply at our data? Well, the first, and I think to some of you, perhaps, the most obvious tool is the histogram. What's a histogram? Uh, to make a histogram, you take your data and you divide it into bins. Uh, if our data are humans, we might bin on height, so we'll have one bin for all the people that are five foot nine, and another bin for all the people that are six foot, another for those that are six foot one. We line our data up into bins, uh, and when you're all done, you count how many people are in each bin, and now you have a histogram, a chart that shows how many observations fell into each bucket. And among those people, there was an average height. It was just under 68 inches. 
Um, but if you were a space alien learning about humans, you'd probably find this shape, this curve, a lot more interesting than just knowing the average. You might, in fact, ask yourself, like, why is the curve kind of asymmetric? Like, why are there just a few really tall people over here on the right and a lack of correspondingly short people over here on the left? And you can probably guess the answer, which I think is mostly due to the fact that there are really two curves here, one for men and one for women, and they've been mashed together. In this shot, it might be hard to see it, uh, but the people are all holding up little cards. The men are holding up blue cards and the women pink ones. Uh, and here are the data presented as two overlapping histograms. And so now if you're the space alien, you know a lot more. You know that there are at least two kinds of humans, and they tend to differ in height. And the key point here is that if all you had was the average and you never looked at this curve, you would never have thought to ask the kinds of questions that lead to this kind of insight. Okay, fine, you say, what has all this got to do with performance and operations? Well, we can play the exact same game with this kind of data, with latency data. Let's take each of the individual requests that went into this point, cut them up into 20 millisecond buckets, and count how many fell into each bucket. If you go back to your office and actually do this with your site, which I encourage you strongly to do, um, if your site and your customers are very well behaved, you'll get a curve that looks something like this. Uh, this is a histogram. Latency is on the x-axis in 20 millisecond buckets, and the count of requests in each bucket is on the y-axis. And this shape is very characteristic of website latency. Statisticians call this curve uh, a gamma distribution. Uh, and it frequently arises when you measure the total time to do a sequence of tasks. And that's what rendering a web page is, right? You have to do a DNS lookup, establish a TCP connection, render some HTML, then the browser's got to do more DNS lookups and establish more TCP connections to download the assets, right? A sequence of tasks. Uh, and whenever you have a process like that, a sequence of tasks, each of which usually completes quickly, but sometimes takes a very long time to complete, you drop a packet or whatnot, um, you get a curve that has this shape. But recall that what I said is that this is what you'll get if your customers and your site are well behaved. I'd be willing to bet that for a lot of you, if you went home and you made this curve, you'd see something more like this. Right? And that's a little weird. Now there's two big lumps. And now you are the space alien. Right? Like, why are there two big lumps? Uh, and since I generated this data, I know the answer. I artificially slowed down half of the hits. I added 300 milliseconds to half of the hits. So there's really two of the normal gamma curves here, one for each population. And when you add them together, you get this. Uh, and so when you see something like this, if you go back home and you see something like this, you should be very, very happy. Because now you have a really interesting question. What makes the people in this lump different from the people in this lump? Uh, and when you start looking at distributions like this, they, that's what happens. They instantly provoke a million questions, none of which would have ever occurred if all you were looking at was this curve, or this shape, pardon me. Um, and not only is chasing down the, the answers to those questions interesting and fun, the answers tell you how to make your site faster for your customers, which is why you are doing any of this in the first place. And if you haven't spent time looking at histograms like this before, this contrived example where I've slowed down half of the hits, it might seem far-fetched, but this kind of thing happens all the time. So suppose that half of your customers are logged in and half of them aren't, and you do special nice things for your customers, like you show them their picture or you let them customize their display somehow. Um, all that takes time, and it manifests itself as a curve like this. Um, more insidious, suppose that there's a race condition in your code that randomly introduces a delay half of the time. This kind of bug is very easy to introduce, uh, and you might never see it during your testing because it depends, for example, on the latency of your content delivery networks, which is constant for you from your office but varies widely for your customers. And so from your office in San Francisco, your site might be fast, but from Dallas, maybe your site is slow. So if you see something like this, you're in good shape, right? Two big, obvious groups to go after. But if you're just a little bit less lucky, you might see something like this. So does that look odd to you? Can you see something wrong with the curve? There's this little lump down here. It's a little funny. It doesn't trail off like the other ones that we've been looking at. And what's going on here is I've only slowed down 10% of the hits. 
And when you add that little slow distribution to the big one, you get this. And that little lump down there, it's called a shoulder. Statisticians frequently call it a shoulder. And the point of showing you this is that when you've been looking at these curves for just a little while, the pattern recognition wetware that you carry around between your ears gets very finely attuned to minute changes in the shapes of these curves. You start to notice changes that are actually much smaller than the one that I've shown here. So hopefully at this point you were at least on board with the notion that histograms provide far more information than simple time series plots. Uh, and it's worth pausing here for a moment that I know of no monitoring software that automates the generation of plots like these. Um, you usually have to go back and create them by hand by yourself from the, law da from the raw data. Uh, and I think this represents an opportunity for the folks that build monitoring software. Uh, like, what if you could view the distribution uh, of the data underneath any point as you moused over a time series plot? Or here's a better example. This is a very happy looking time series chart. Uh, in the middle, it looks like we deployed a change that reduced the average latency by a big chunk, you know, super exciting, you know, pop the champagne. Or maybe not, so let's actually look at our data. Uh, this is uh, still a time series plot. Time is on the x-axis marching along from left to right. Uh, and you can, you can still see the average latency plotted down there as a, as a line. Um, but I've added another layer, which is showing a full histogram laid out vertically at each point in time. And now color is encoding the height of the histogram. And now that you can see more deeply into your data set, now that you're not just looking at a single summary statistic, you find that you made the site a little bit faster for a lot of people and a lot slower for some other people, right? The red has shifted down a little bit, but the blue smeared out a whole lot. Um, and the, the point of showing you this is, is, to, is to, to say that it's easy to make and it, a change like this. And unless you're really looking at your data, you'll never know when you've done something like this. You won't have the opportunity to decide whether on balance you are doing the right thing for your customers. So suppose you find yourself in this situation. How can you figure out what happened? And there are all kinds of very fancy statistical machine learning methods that you can use to try to automatically tease apart uh, what is going on in the different populations in, in your data. Um, but in my experience, there's really no silver bullet that works universally. Uh, and that's where these guys come back into the picture. These folks are Amazon customers that have uploaded pictures of themselves using products that they bought on the site. And the thing that we must always remember is that just as this shape was formed by literally lining people up into rows, so too it is with this display. There are individual customers standing in each of those little boxes. And to figure out what's really going on with your site, you often need to look at individual hits in the greatest detail. As the title of my talk suggests, you need to look at your data. And sometimes what that means is you need to look at the raw logs. Uh, no graphs, you know, no fancy visualizations, just good old text. Uh, so I'll illustrate this with an Amazon story. Uh, one day I was trying to figure out what was going on uh, with the site by looking at charts that were very much like the ones that I've just been showing you. Uh, and, and I had been trolling through the logs and I hit across a, a particular session that had transitioned from being consistently fast to being consistently slow. And now trying to figure out what's going on with just one session is often a wild goose chase. You know, for all we know, they turned on their microwave and like completely destroyed their wireless network at home. Uh, but often enough, it is worth persevering. So what I did is I printed out uh, the detailed logs with everything that we knew about how those hits had been served, and I laid them out on the floor and started pouring over them. And I will admit, this is a low-tech approach to troubleshooting, right? But the beauty of this technique is that it is intensely multivariate. So what I mean by that, multivariate. This is what the Apache documentation uses as a typical example of an access log format. There are seven dimensions here, and this is really a pretty bare bones access log. Your access log has probably got more dimensions than this. Uh, if you add in error logs, client side logging, back end service telemetry, you can quickly get to hundreds or thousands of dimensions for every hit that you serve. And the trouble, of course, is that you can't render hundreds or thousands of dimensions on your two dimensional computer screen. This is the famous uh, Charles Menard rendering of Napoleon's ill fated march on Moscow. Edward Tufte calls it possibly the greatest statistical graphic ever drawn. And it only manages to display six dimensions the position of the army in two dimensions, the size of the army encoded as the width of the bar, the, 
the direction the army is moving, encoded as the color of the bar, and then along the bottom, a time series plot of the time and the temperature. And if you'll allow me another Tufti quote, in one of his books, Tufti says that graphical excellence is that which gives to the viewer the greatest number of ideas in the shortest time with the least ink in the smallest space, which I will argue sometimes means that this is a pretty good graphical display. <laughs> you have literally at your fingertips hundreds of pieces of data about every hit. You can rearrange the pages and use your powerful spatial memory to keep track of ideas. You can write on the paper to annotate important hypotheses. You can put your finger on a piece of data in one log over here and locate the corresponding piece of data in another log over here and then go back and forth quickly and compare what's going on. And sometimes just looking at the printed pages from a distance reveals interesting patterns about the texture of the print or the, or the shape of how the lines wrap. I, I will point out again that you carry in between your ears a tremendously powerful pattern matching system. And so it only makes sense to get as much data as possible in front of that system. Okay, so I'm sitting there on the floor with my little sheets of paper, uh, and it didn't take very long to notice that things got slow for this person when they got bound to a particular set of machines that could be used as a final test bed for new software before it got deployed to the rest of the fleet. And so sweet, I'm thinking, this is awesome, like smoking gun, like what test is running on, that, on those machines? Except that there was no test being run on those machines, no test being conducted at the time. The set of machines was running the identical software to the rest of the fleet. So back to the drawing board, I had to look in actually more logs uh, for a, a little bit longer to figure out that this set of test machines were configured in such a way that every hit to, had to endure a series of redirects before it landed finally on the correct machine. And uh, no surprise, that series of redirects added a tremendous amount of latency to every hit. So later that day, we pushed a config change to, to fix things. We got rid of the redirects and everybody was happy. And the key thing about this is that these, th these test machines represented only a tiny fraction of the total fleet and, and every customer that got bound to them was only bound to them for a very short period of time and so it only affected any one customer for a short period of time. And so the size of the impact was probably less than a pixel on a time series plot of our average latencies. Uh, but it was a case that accounted for some of the worst performing hits on the site. And probably the most effective way to find it was to get down on our hands and knees on the floor with a highlighter and look, try to make sense of the data in its rawest possible form. So I urge you to look at your data. And I mean really look deeply at your data down to the finest level of detail possible. Because if you're not looking at your data, at least occasionally in its rawest possible form, then you don't understand your business and you almost certainly don't understand your customers. That's all I have, thanks for your time.